very different kinds of music and three very different kinds of movies, three of the year's best films. I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel, and those three musical films are on both Roger and my top ten films list for 1984. We'll be showing you scenes from each of them and other pictures on our lists, some of which are not so well known. And then at the end of the show, we'll each read off our entire personal top ten list. And there are some big differences, so stick around and see if you agree. Okay, let's start out with one of the movies that's on both of our lists. It's Purple Rain. Starring Prince, the rock phenomenon from Minneapolis, and for me, this is one of the big surprises of the year, the best rock and roll debut film since the Beatles made A Hard Day's Night. And Purple Rain was a lot more than just a music film. It was also the story of a kid growing up in an unhappy household, yeah. and it was also a love story. Here's one of the love scenes starring Prince and his electrifying discovery, Apollonia Cotero. Of course, that whole movie was engineered by Prince and his people personally, and not a year goes by without some rock superstar or another announcing that he's going to produce his own movie. He's going to control everything just like he does on stage or in the recording studio, and then the movie comes out, and it's a disorganized and pretentious mess. Sounds like the Paul McCartney movie this year. Yes, you'd think Paul McCartney, after 20 years, would know at least as much as Prince knows, but not on the basis of, right. uh, of what we saw this year. That's one of the reasons that... Purple Rain is such a surprise. Prince did control this project. It is based more or less loosely on his own life story and on a screenplay that he wrote, and it was made out of the Hollywood mainstream, made in Minneapolis by people that Hollywood hadn't really heard of before. And yet, yeah. it's a combination of real content and real sensitivity combined with incredibly high-energy rock, and that's why it's on my list. And it is expertly done at every technical mm -hmm. level. There's no sacrifice going out of Hollywood. Right. They have made a first-class picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing, you compare it to Hard Day's Night, and that's a good comparison. I'll compare it to Saturday Night Fever. This is just seven years later, approximately, mm -hmm. and it's the same story. Young man wants to be a musician or mm -hmm. wants to be a dancer. Uh, she tries to see if he can be friends with a girl. Mm -hmm. He knows he can be hostile and angry with a girl. Mm -hmm. Can he be friends with a girl? And then uh, the dealing with the parents uh -huh. and the same and the households are almost just mm -hmm. as violent. Uh, so and it's updated, different kind of music, classic youth Another story. Another interesting thing about it in the old days, whenever there was a new rock star, mm -hmm. Hollywood always tried to figure out how what kind of a role can he play. Elvis, you know, Elvis Presley, Pat Boone, right. uh, Frankie Avalon. What kind of a character can he play? Put him in Prince, a western. Yeah. Prince plays himself. Yes. He's like nobody else we've seen in the movies. Mm -hmm. He's individual, he's unique, and that's what makes the movie. And that's why it was smart for him to control the project, mm -hmm. I guess. Now, coming up next at the movies, a powerful film set in war-torn Cambodia. I'm reported to Morgan. I know his heart. I love him like my brother. And I do anything for him. Anything. Another film on both of our top ten lists is The Killing Fields, a most powerful film about the destruction of the nation of Cambodia and three million of its people by communist-led forces in the mid-1970s. That's how the land there came to be known as The Killing Fields. And on a personal level, this movie is the story of a great friendship between a New York Times reporter and a Cambodian journalist who served as his guide and interpreter. Their friendship is tested when everyone must abandon the capital city of Cambodia, which is under siege, and at the airport, the New York Times reporter helps his friend's family to safety.
Now the two of them are left there, but he won't be able to help his friend later on. And it's a very good scene because the decision there with Mike Oldfield's musical score is to play the music down. When you have a tension-filled scene, there's no reason to blast it, yet most filmmakers would blast the music. Now, as the film progresses, those two men are separated as director Roland Jaffe gives equal time to both of their stories. The reporter receiving journalistic awards in New York in safety, while the Cambodian struggles to stay alive in the giant death camp that his native Cambodia has become. And simply by giving equal time to both men in both of their stories, this film makes its point about the equality of man, which tragically wasn't the worldview at the time of the Cambodian slaughter. The Killing Fields is very special because it works both as a movie drama and it also has something very real to say about the world in which we live. Yeah, and it also doesn't go for a cheap, uh, easy solution such as all these movies we've had where the kind of John Wayne clones and the uh, retired Green Berets get up a force and they go in and they shoot right. everything up and save everybody. And there are more of those films coming, by the way, too. Yeah, and there's no way, this movie is very, very realistic in pointing mm -hmm. out, there's no way that this guy can be helped. It's, you know, he's in there on his own, he's got to get out on his own. It's very dramatic. And they tell the story, they stay with his story, yeah. they give him mm -hmm. equal time. The yellow man, the white man get equal stories, and that doesn't happen very often in the movies. That's right. The Killing Fields was on both of our lists, but here's a movie that was only on my list of the years best films. It's called Stranger Than Paradise. It's just now going into release around the country. It's a funny and touching slice of life. The story of a kid who's sort of a bum and lives in a tough New York neighborhood and about a 16-year-old cousin who comes to visit him all the way from Hungary. Once she arrives here in the promised land, she does what a lot of teenagers would do. She hangs around and listens to music. He's a wild man, so bug off. Oh, man. Um, I got something for you. What is it? It's a present. Present? Mm. Thanks. What is it? It's a dress? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I think it's kind of ugly. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you? Later in the film, the young girl goes to Cleveland to visit her aunt, and then the guy and his friend go out to Cleveland to meet up with the girl, and the three of them go down to Florida kind of a low-budget, easy rider, and they get involved in a scam so perfect and so funny that even to say one word about it would ruin it, so I won't. But Stranger Than Paradise is a real discovery, a low-budget, independent American movie that has won top prizes at Cannes and other big film festivals, and that is so original and so entertaining that it reminds me of movies like Marty, the original Rocky and some of John Cassavetes' best work. I liked it very much, too, and the only reason I didn't make my top ten is I liked ten films more. Okay. But it made my runner-up list of 16 films, which uh -huh. meant that this was a pretty good year. I had 26 films. Normally, I have about nine competing <laughs> for, for ten. Uh, I like the unpredictability of the film. Mm -hmm. That's what I admire so much about it. And it is just The spontaneity, the freshness, the yeah. idea of low-key that these are real people who are doing these things. It was very, a real nice feeling. Very well done. A real good film. Coming up next at the movies, a visit to a notorious Harlem hangout. If you have a try my meat, you will never get it The next choice from both of our top ten lists is Francis Coppola's The Cotton Club. It's the story of white gangsters and black entertainers all struggling to get ahead. The black story is more interesting, though, because we've seen it less. And one of the film's bright spots is a dazzling performance by Larry Marshall playing the role of Cab Calloway, who did perform regularly at the Harlem Cotton Club in the 1920s.
that was Richard Gere there, who is a cornet player, and he turns into a movie star. He has an easier time than the black performers in this film. The Cotton Club is full of entertainment like that, but overriding it all is the story of people trying very hard to get ahead any way they can. Some of these stories aren't pretty, but they're just as real and as entertaining as the musical numbers themselves. And what I like best about this film is that an entire world has been created, and we feel its richness and its completeness in every scene. It's just not one person trying to do one thing and doing it by the time the movie's over. And that's a great accomplishment in creating an entire world for any film. I agree with everything you've said, Thank oddly you. enough. I think it's a great movie. I enjoyed it too. You know, the one thing that bothers me though is that I've been reading so much about how much it right. costs and this all the sickening. coverage of whether or not it will make its money back and whether who cares? Robert Edwards or Francis Coppola was the one who was in charge who of uh, running up the bills. This movie is going to get lost in the middle of all that ridiculous financial reporting. Yeah. It's a fun movie. Yeah. Why can't people just go to it and have a good time without bringing in their balance sheets? And this is one time the press is at fault because it's a lot right. easier to write stories about numbers than it is about art. You're absolutely right. And so that's right. why the number story is getting the attention of the film should be. Okay, good for you. So we say it's yeah. on our list of good movies. We don't care how much it costs. The next of the <laughs> movies, my choice for the year's best film, the story of a punk teenage genius who was a lot like Prince and whose name was Mozart. Forgive me, Majesty. I'm a vulgar man. But I assure you, my music is not. My personal choice for the best film of 1984 is Amadeus, a movie by Milos Forman based on a play by Peter Schaffer about the musical genius Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and his bitter rival, Antonio Salieri, who both admired and envied Mozart. The movie contains a brilliant performance by F. Murray Abraham as Salieri, who's an old man when he tells his memories of the young genius who burst on the 18th century European musical stage. Play Salieri. Now that is a challenge. That is a challenge. Please, please. Mozart laughing, Father. That was God. That was God laughing at me through that, through that obscene giggle. And that was Tom Hulse as Mozart in one of the year's most engaging performances. This movie doesn't contain one bit of the pretentious solemnity that we usually associate with movie biographies of classical musicians. It's a cheerful, rambunctious, irreverent film, a movie that isn't so much concerned with the actual details of Mozart's life as with its own feelings about his genius, his personality, and his experiences as one of the very first victims of celebrity, one of the first superstars. What I love about the film is that it celebrates creativity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that is a subject that most Hollywood movies are simply not concerned with. A has, very fine film. Has some great music on the soundtrack, too. Yeah. <laughs> I liked one film more than that. The film that I picked over Amadeus as the best of the year is Sergio Leone's Sprawling Once Upon a Time in America which has a lot of faults, a lot of confusing scenes, and flat-out mistakes. But I admire the reach of this film, which is just as great as Amadeus and the Cotton Club, telling the epic saga of a bunch of immigrant children in New York after the turn of the century, and how, like the adults of the Cotton Club, they become gangsters and walk all over everybody. And at the center of the film is a character played by Robert De Niro, who is a more thoughtful man than his young friends, and yet he, too, to his everlasting regret, pursues a life of crime. Pay him. Tell me. Being is that I can change it. I'd already made the deal with Frankie to get rid of Joe. 
With a man like Frankie Minaldi, you don't say yes and then say no. I cannot take the chance to change your mind. You understand? Well, you were right. I would have said no. Frankie Minaldi is as big as they come. He's got the combination in the palm of his hand. If we're not careful, he's going to have us in the palm of his hand. You don't get nowhere alone. I thought you were the guy that said you didn't like bosses. It sounded like a good idea then. It still is. Let's just think about it, Noodles. They're going to ask us to come in with them. There's a lot in it for us. Today they ask us to get rid of Joe. Tomorrow they ask me to get rid of you. Is that okay with you? Because it's not okay with me. That was James Woods with Robert De Niro, and they really are two sides of the same character, the grasping one played by Woods and the more thoughtful one played by De Niro. And when De Niro in this film repeatedly chooses greed over the love of a young woman, it's very sad. A wonderful film, and I should point out, I am reviewing and praising the long version of this film, three and three-quarter hours, not the shorter version, about two and a half hours that came out this summer. That was a chopped up mess. The long version is the one to see. It's a very good film. I think the only thing that kept it off my list was the feeling that the short version was the one that was released and played in most theaters. This long version is only playing in a few art theaters around the country. And so it find kind of, it, find it, it find it. It fell through the sieve somehow, mm -hmm. but it's a very good film and a lost film too, unless they get to see that long and, version. And as much as as great as the film is, the performance by De Niro is a full man's life and quite wonderful, I think. Real good one. Now let's take a look at my choice of the year's ten best films in order, reverse order. Number ten, Purple Rain, with a lot of music and a lot of truth from Prince. In ninth place, Choose Me, the offbeat comedy about saloon people, starring Jean-Vierre Bujol, Keith Carradine, and Leslie Ann Warren. Eighth place, Stranger Than Paradise, with a Hungarian girl and three louts on an odyssey of discovery. Seventh, The Killing Fields, the heartbreaking story of a friendship between two journalists, one American, one Cambodian. Sixth place, Robert Altman's extraordinary secret honor, which imagines the confessions of Richard M. Nixon. In fifth place, Francis Coppola's wonderful new movie, The Cotton Club, exploring the worlds of jazz and crime in the 1920s. Fourth place, this is Spinal Tap, a brilliant and hilarious satire on the whole world of rock documentaries. Third place, John Cassavetes' Love Stream, starring Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins as two neurotics at the ends of their ropes. Second place, Paris, Texas, with Harry Dean Stanton as a wanderer who tries to reunite his broken family. And the best film of the year, Milos Forman's Amadeus. And here's the rundown now, bottom to top for me. Number 10, Robert Redford in the great baseball fable, The Natural. I loved every corny bit of it. Number 9, the year's funniest film, even funnier than Spinal Tap, Dudley Moore married to two pregnant women in Blake Edwards, Mickey and Maud. Number 8, David Lean's amazingly complete A Passage to India, a tremendous saga of two cultures failing to understand each other and more often than not, not trying to understand. Number seven, I like Secret Honor 2, that crazy funny film about Richard Nixon with an amazing performance by Philip Baker Hall. Number six, The Killing Fields, the Cambodian-based story of a remarkable friendship that triumphs over racism. Number five, Prince's film debut in Purple Rain. Number four, from France, Diane Curie's Entre Nous, an epic story of the friendship between two women with one liberating the other. Number three, Francis Coppola's epic, The Cotton Club. And number two, Milos Forman's Amadeus, and the best film of 1984, says me, Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America, with a towering performance by Robert De Niro. You know, it wasn't that bad of a year. This is pretty good here. You know, the funny thing about your list is I liked all the films on it for a change. <laughs> I, I, there I, have been a few years, and that hasn't been the case. I was envying yours while you were reading yours. Okay, maybe we should make the top 20 next year. That's it for this week. Next week at the movies, the flip side of the coin, the worst movies of the year. Yes, we're going to have a Roam of the Educated Skunk back again. He's going to be on hand for a program we call The Stinkers of 1984. And until then, we'll see you at the movies. Diet Shasta, now with the great taste of NutraSweet with 18 fabulous flavors. Even the toughest critics say, I want a pop. Diet Shasta. Pan-American, whether it's business or pleasure or a little bit of both, across the country or around the world, Pan Am, you can't beat the experience. Goober's freshly roasted peanuts dipped in delicious milk chocolate. Enjoy America's favorite movie time candy at home or at the movies. Raisinets and snow caps, too. Glade Smoke Away, a tough glade specially formulated to eliminate smoke odors instantly and make your home fresher.
A quiet and thoughtful little movie named The Flamingo Kid is one of the most enjoyable sleepers of the Christmas season, and it may be around long after some of the big-budget bombs like Dune have disappeared. Movie stars Matt Dillon is a teenager from a lower-class New York background who gets a summer job as a cabana boy at an exclusive Long Island beach club. And on the job, he begins to admire a flashy car dealer played by Richard Crenna, who is the undisputed champion of the club's gin rummy tables. Here they are in this scene. You are what you wear. Yeah, you know, I've heard that before. What is that, a satin? Satin shirt? Satin? The shirt satin? You kidding, satin? Come here. Come here, satin. Feel that. Feel that, satin. Silk. Ah, oh, geez, you know, it's I should have known. It's Chinese silk. This is beautiful. Baby. You like it, huh? Oh, it's great. I want you to have it. Oh, uh, Mr. Brody, you don't Jeffrey, have to do Jeffrey, please, that. I want you to have it, all right? Yeah, you don't You're know. You're going to love this shirt. I don't have to do it. I don't have to do anything. The Flamingo Kid is a movie about self-discovery, and the Matt Dillon that you see in that scene is a lot different from the person he becomes at the end of the film. First, he embraces the materialistic values of the beach club, then he questions them and finally does a lot of growing up. The Flamingo Kid is a good movie, sometimes funny, sometimes very penetrating in its social criticism, and it has a great performance in it by Matt Dillon, one of our most talented and natural younger actors. I'm Roger Ebert at the Movies.